yesterday uh, so that yogis uh, who want to get a collected mind in a short time and who want to see the mental and physical phenomena that are really there the way they are and also to be able to see how these mental and physical phenomena are related as cause and effect and to develop knowledge stage by stage until finally one one realizes very special Dhamma. For this to happen, Sayadawji has been teaching according to what the Buddha taught under as the as instructed by the late most venerable Mahasi Sierra. Uh, the teachers here have been teaching like this, combining the theory with what they know of the practice. And they have been urging the yogis in the practice. This task is extremely valuable. It is excellent. And it is guaranteed to work. So, um, Sierraji and the teachers tell the yogis in order to awaken their faith so that there will be the desire to gain true happiness. And this is the teacher's responsibility to, um, to urge the yogis in this way. And during the practice, they also need to discuss with the yogis how the yogis are applying the practice. This is not uh, like an examination, but it is truly discussion, a give and take. And the teachers, if they see that the yogis uh, how the yogi works is not straight, then they have to straighten it. If they see that um, the, the aim or something is not accurate, then they have to um, make, show how to make things accurate. And if there's missing, something's missing, the, yogi, the teachers have to show how, the, how this missing item should be fulfilled. So the teachers have to correct the yogis. And the, the meditation teachers can just about do that much. So for this, uh, to this end, Sierraji uh, spoke yesterday in detail about uh, using a very obvious example, the most obvious example of what happens in the moment when one goes from standing to sitting down, how, how to observe at that moment and what happens. So if one performs the act of going from standing to sitting down without any awareness, then one won't know anything. But if one observes the process from the very start, observing it moment by moment, bit by bit, as the body gradually sits down, then one will start to discern the true nature that is happening at that moment. So one needs to apply one's enter energy. One needs to apply energy so that the mind will reach this sitting down action and one has to apply aim. So these, when one does this, then the mind doesn't go anywhere else. So for the mind to reach the sitting down uh, action, then one has to apply energy. And for the mind to be focused accurately on this process, then one has to aim the mind. The aiming, aiming is a jhanic factor. It makes the mind focused exactly. And this is needed every second of the time, these two qualities. 
of aiming and effort. And if we do this, as Theodoji mentioned, there's the form, there's the manner or position, and there's sabhava, true nature. And the mind will fall on one of these three. So the one, the mind may reach the body. The mind, the mind will see the body. Or the mind will fall on the sitting down process. Even though knowledge is not arising in that moment, because the mind is, is staying there, this yogi is, is good. And if one continues from this point, when one's notings are consecutive, then usually what, will one, what one will start to see is the physicality, the rupa, or matter. So the mind will fall on stiffness and no stiffness, on tension. The mind will know tension or heaviness or heat, warmth. Or the mind will then start to know things like discomfort or comfort, the Vedana. So this is what is happening in one's being. And one knows these things because the mind has the energy to go past the form and go past the manner, the position of sitting down and see what is really there at the moment. It can't be denied when the mind falls on stiffness and one knows stiffness, that stiffness is really there. One can't deny it. When the mind falls on tension and one knows the tension, that tension is really there. If the mind falls on heaviness and one knows the heaviness, that heaviness is really there. It's not imaginary. And this is knowing the truth of suffering, knowing dukkha sacha in a gross way. So at that moment, there are the mental factors of virya, effort, sati, mindfulness, and samadhi, concentration. And at that, at that moment, the mind is clean. When those three factors are present, the mind is pure. If one observes carelessly, one doesn't gain those, these qualities in the moment of observation. One, one loses these qualities every moment when one is careless. Or if there is no noting happening at all. So if one is careless or doesn't note at all, then the mind will not even get to the body, won't even get to the form. And if that is the case, this is a deliberate waste of one's valuable time. If one doesn't get the mind at least to uh, observe the, the form, then if one practices carelessly for a week, one, nothing special will happen. If one care, <coughs> practices care, carelessly for two weeks or a month, nothing special will happen. So in that situation, one is being careless with the practice and the teachers uh, won't, will not take the yogi seriously anymore. There's nothing the teachers can do in that case. So coming here, the yogis have come from far away They've separated from their families and left their work behind. So if one comes here to do this type of work, which needs to be done carefully, it's, a, it's something that one has to make effort in order to do. So if instead one ap applies oneself carelessly, or not at all, then one will have already lost the money one put into getting here, 
One is separated from one's family, so one isn't enjoying that. One is, has left work behind. If one does the work here carelessly, then one loses on both sides. So one has to make it worthwhile, having come here. And therefore, one should understand what the benefits are of the practice. And understanding them, one should value them, value the practice, want to get the benefits, and apply oneself to the practice in both a way that is respectful and careful and without taking breaks. This is uh, Sakachakirya and Satachakirya. In order to gain, to get samatha concentration, and from here to distinguish between mind and matter, nama and rupa, and to know their true nature, one needs sakachakirya, respectful practice, and one also needs satachakirya. These are that's. Um, meticulous and continuous working. So this is what is mentioned in the texts that one needs to work in this way. And Sierraji gives an example from the texts of how carefully, how how respectfully and carefully one has to work. So when one is in a, a mountainous area a forested mountainous area and between two mountains or two hills uh, there's a big chasm and across to go from one mountain to the other there's a very narrow bridge this bridge is just wide enough to put one step down at a time it's it's just wide enough for one foot and that's all so one has to go across such a bridge, such an extremely narrow bridge, very carefully. One has to walk with meticulous care, being aware of where one puts on foot each time. One can't move quickly in going across this very narrow bridge because it's, if one goes fast, one will fall off and it's a long way down. So one has to go slowly. If one goes slowly, but without taking care, then one won't know where one has put one's foot down, and then one will misstep. So one can't just go slowly. It has to also be careful with awareness. We have to look, one has to look carefully, meticulously, and walking in that way, one will be able to get across this bridge. One can't go fast on such a bridge, and one can't go without awareness. One has to go slowly, carefully, with awareness. So sometimes, uh, some people think, well, we only know something because of thinking about it. Knowledge only arises due to thinking. Well, in this case, think about it. You know, can you cross the bridge using thinking power? If you get lost in thought as you're trying to cross this very narrow bridge, you're not going to be aware of where you're putting your feet down, and so you will fall off. So one can't, um, one has to put all one's attention to just walking carefully across the bridge. So uh, the yogis here uh, now, sorry, we have to work like this as, as Sayadoji mentioned. So we have to um, be aware of whether we're standing, sitting, 
uh, walking or lying down. These are the four major postures. So we should be aware of our posture. And within these major postures, the body is doing things such as bending or stretching, leaning, tilting the head, opening and closing the eyes, blinking. And each of these actions, each of these small postures happens in their own time. In each of these, there is nama and rupa occurring. And <clears throat> one has to carefully observe, respectfully, meticulously, in order to be able to see these things which are really there. One has to, sorry, one has to put aside one's accumulated knowledge and apply 100% of your mind to the practice. You can't have your mind on other things you've learned. You have to put 100% of your mind on, on this task of observation. So just like we have to walk the very narrow bridge between the two high mountains very carefully, meticulously, uh, this is also the way we have to do the practice each moment. And if we do this, we will get immediately immediate results. Another analogy from the text is how one has to carry a bowl that is full to the brim with oil. If one is going to move something like that from one place to another, one has to be ex handle this bowl extremely carefully because the slightest jiggle is going to cause the oil to spill. So, and then the oil spills and the oil will uh, get one's clothes dirty. So, one has to apply extreme care when moving something like that. And it's the same as we practice. This is a, a way of saying how careful we need to be. So, when one goes from standing to sitting down, mind and matter, nama and rupa, are happening at that moment. And if we perform the change of posture from standing to sitting carelessly, then one won't know anything, just the way if one tries to shift to move this bowl full to the brim of oil, the oil will be lost in the same way our mindfulness is lost, our mental energies are lost if we don't apply care in observing. If we don't apply care as we cross the bridge, we'll fall off. So carelessness amounts to death. Pamada is, is negligence. But on the other hand, if we're heedful, we can live. So there's bending, stretching, leaning, sitting, uh, lifting, moving, placing. One has to apply a mental effort and one has to do these actions slowly. However, when others are involved, for example, when going to the meals, when getting the food at the buffet, one can't go slowly. One has to go at a normal speed because of the because others are affected by by our movements so the rest of the time when other people are not involved and affected by our moving slowly we can go as slowly as we want to we can't do things carelessly so one should as Sieroji mentioned the mental factors which are needed if one has faith and confidence in the benefits that come from the practice, desire to get the benefits, and one applies one's effort to observe, 
plus aim so that the one's mind is focused accurately. If one has these factors, then there is no need to do anything special to create sati, samadhi, and panya, observation, concentration, and wisdom. Those things will happen naturally. Still, there are some yogis who have practiced according to other methods or other yogis who haven't practiced according to other methods but have gained some, have studied some things. And here we have the instruction that starting with the rising and the falling, we observe whatever arises using a label labeling that thing rising, rising is rising, falling is falling. And some, uh, this is needed. The reason why the teachers say to do this is because it's necessary. Some people think, well, there's no need to label. You know, they think, um, they think like this. So, Sayadawji mentions about how children learn when they're starting out in school, kindergarten or nursery, nursery school. At first, you know, they don't know how to read yet, and so they have to learn this. And first of all, they have to learn the alphabet, A, B, C, and so on. And they have to write it, learn how to write it, but they also have to learn how to say the letters. One can't just learn what the letters look like. One has to also learn their sound. So one has to learn the pronunciation by saying the letters. And then one... uh, So one has to learn in this way. And after one learns how to say the letters and write them, then one can spell. C-A-T, cat, and R-A-T, rat. So, and, and one, here one also spells things aloud. And so, Seroji said, please think about how you learned when you were in kindergarten. So, one can't start with just reading right away. One has to learn uh, bit by bit, appropriately. And one has to, there's usually, reading aloud is involved. Children have to learn how to read words and how to read sentences. And usually this is, there's reading aloud part of this. So here, what we do in the practice is that we observe rising is rising. When there's rising, we note it as rising. When we are observing the falling, we note it as falling. We use the label, sitting is sitting, touching is touching. And this helps us to distinguish one thing from another. So we don't use other names, names that are not relevant. So for example, um, if, if, if we're observing bending, we don't call it stretching, we call it bending. We use the terms that most people know. Whether we use a different language or not is not the issue. The thing is to use common vocabulary. And so standing, we, we note standing as standing, not as sitting. So the practice is to just observe things, observe what is as it is. As is mentioned, Bhutan, Buddha, Tropasati. And so we use labels as part of this observation because it, it uh, helps to distinguish things. So think about kindergarten, nursery school, how you learn to read. And uh, think about how uh, usually we learn to read, including reading aloud. So here, we don't say the labels aloud. We just use the names, but but we don't have to actually speak them. At the start of practice, 
one has to use these labels. And this is not anything new. This has been done for a long time. In the texts, this is called Taja Panyati. Panyati means name or concept. And it is the name that is appropriate for what occurs. It's the name which is connected for the real thing that one is observing. So the name appropriate to the arising object, the thing that we are observing, this is called tajapanyati. So that means that um, when hardness, when we observe hardness, we use the label hardness for it. That's the name that is appropriate for that thing. Softness, label it as softness. Hot as hot, cold as cold. Stiffness as stiffness, tension as tension. And whatever the language is that we're using, one uses the appropriate word for the phenomena that one is seeing. So in Pali, this is called Tajapanyati, this relevant name. And so some think, well, what is what we're observing, you know, what we're trying to, we're doing this observation for is to know the ultimate reality, to know things that are really there. And this name is involved, this concept is involved. So is it really necessary? Because here we are, we're trying to know true nature with our mind. So isn't this use of a label just something extra? Okay, so the answer is that before samadhi and knowledge arise, you have to use these labels. But when samadhi and knowledge, that is when the bhavana mind arises, one can't use these labels. There's, there's no longer any need for them. So uh, at, the, at that time, the object and the obse- observation are happening precisely. They're meeting precisely time and again. And applying a name gets in the way. So in such, a, uh, in such instances, when, this, when samadhi and knowledge have arisen and bhavana is occurring, then one has two methods of using labels at that time. One can simply apply the label to whatever one can, just here and there, because one can't catch everything. Or one can just look at things, watch, without applying the labels. Before samadhi and knowledge have arisen, this type of observation is not realistic. A person can't just do this from the start. It happens after not samadhi and knowledge have arisen. So in, uh, to, to compare with the an analogy that Sayadoji gave, you know, can kindergarten students, when they're first learning to read, can they just start by reading a whole essay? So one has to use labels. One has to think about this, and one <coughs> needs to use labels because it is needed. And to use labels is according to the text. It's not something extra. There are still some yogis who look here and there. And Sierraji has seen this, for example, going to the dining hall. Looking here and there is not necessary. Some yogis, when they hear a sound, they turn their head. So this is not uh, this is not needed. When we do this, it destroys our awareness. It destroys our concentration. So the yogis have to remember that although they have eyes that are perfectly capable of seeing, they have to behave as though they are a blind person. That means that they can't react 
to what is seen. They just have to be aware of the process of seeing. And although one has ears and can hear perfectly well, one should behave as though one doesn't hear. One shouldn't react to the content of things, but should just try to observe the sound, observe the, the hearing. There's no need to turn and look when hearing happens. What one needs to do is focus one attention, one's attention on hearing. Although one has knowledge, one should behave as though one knows nothing at all. So people have various types of knowledge, having gained an education, having studied, having worked, having read, having reflected. People have many, many types of knowledge. But if we really want to know true nature through this practice, if we really want to know true nature, then we should consider ourselves as someone who knows absolutely nothing. And we should just do this work respectfully and carefully without applying any thought, without applying our past learning. This is not, um, this is not something that we are free to do the way we want to do. We just need to follow instructions. So that is what works, works best. And although one has strength, maybe a lot of strength, one has to behave as though one is quite weak. And this means that no matter how strong and capable one may be, when we do actions, we need to do them as very slowly, as though we're quite weak and infirm. And if you think about how a person with a bad back, how they have to stand up very carefully, because if they stand up quickly, they may hurt their back. So people with back problems will understand uh, the care that needs to be taken by someone who has a bad back. And yogis should really behave like that themselves, although they are perfectly strong and capable. And the last thing that yogis have to remember is that when pain arises, when difficult, unbearable feelings arise, one has to behave as though one were a corpse. Corpses don't uh, respond to the to intense pain. So when yogis meditate, they observe the pain and the pain increases. So at that time, one has to continue to observe the pain. And if one uh, shifts, if one shifts, one will lose one's concentration and one won't get any benefit from one's observation. So one needs to be patient when pain arises. And if one can do this, observe pain patiently, persistently, without reacting to it, then as the concentration increases, one will no longer be aware of any uh, place that aches, and one will just be aware of the pain and the knowing. That's all that there will be. So uh, in this case, the pain has become truly beneficial and pleasant. So uh, when there's only knowing and the pain, this is knowing the true nature. So uh, if one shifts, some people shift when there's just a little bit of pain or they itch every time there's an itch. So if one does this, concentration won't develop. Without concentration, there won't be any knowledge. So one has to take these attitudes. Although one can see, one should take the attitude that one is blind. Although one can hear, one should consider that one is basically deaf. 
one should, although one knows things, one shouldn't use an analytical capability. One should just observe, train one's mind to observe. Although one is strong, one should behave as though one is weak, and particularly when pain is arising, one should just consider that one is like a dead body. So, but Sayadoji is not encouraging you to become dead bodies. Uh, he's just urging you to apply yourself to the practice in a way that will develop knowledge. So he urges you very strongly to take these ideas to heart and apply them. So when one sits, one should sit in an appropriate way, not, um, how should I say? I think Sierraji was talking about holding one's knees up to one uh, with one's arms. So one should sit so that the one's back is up straight. And of course, when one, one is sitting for some time, then uncomfortable feelings arise. And because of these uncomfortable feelings, the mind becomes agitated. So we have to try to observe pain uh, and as a way to to develop knowledge. So our, our objective should not be to eliminate the pain. When uncomfortable feelings arise, we should observe them so as to know what they do, just to watch them. So some meditation teachers say, well, note it and get rid of it. That's not correct. One should note things, observe, things so as to know them. Or the teachers can say, we'll note it until it's gone. That one can say. But our objective should not be to get rid of anything. The objective in meditation is to know, to know what is happening. So to know, to observe whatever arises, this is our job. So not to just get rid of things that are uncomfortable. So if when pain arises, one takes the attitude, I'm going to know this. I'm going to know this, how, to, how it behaves. I'm going to know it stage by stage. Then we know pain makes the mind wither. We know that pain is oppressive. And in order to know this, we observe. So then, when we are, if we can observe like this, our observation is correct. 